Welcome to the Cozy Escape Christmas Read Along. So this is the book for December and usually we vote on it as a group, but because we're running short on time for December and we wanted to have three really quick, nice stories, we just picked this book from Kensington. It is pretty much the same book, I believe, that was read for last year's December book discussion. Um, and I don't mean the same exact book, but the same like concept where it's all Christmas stories and there's three of them and they're short and they're all Kensington authors, which I always love. So we have something special for you today. This episode will be a combo reading and baking. So we're gonna do both of them together. We're gonna do baking first, because in theory, maybe you want to whip something together to eat while you listen to the reading. And I've done something special for my baking section today. I've done a comparison of the recipes that I found here in the book, along with the traditional, I shouldn't say traditional, the easy to make bake mix that you find from Betty Crocker, Ghirardelli, or whatever at the grocery store. So we did a taste test, and I had my friends Caitlin and Camila help me out. So let's get into that. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa and welcome to my Cozy Mystery AuthorTube channel where we talk about all things related to cozy mystery writing. So if this sounds like you or something you might be interested in, make sure to hit the subscribe button below. I post new videos every Monday and I do extra videos like today. So make sure to hit the bell so you get notifications when new videos go live. So Hold up, I am on my way. I'm in motion. To the ocean Yeah, let's go outside We can hang out on the beach Without freezing Yeah, isn't that amazing In Christmas times We'll be chilling and having a good, good time Doesn't matter if the snow is falling dress on the rack where you're like that dress isn't cute but maybe if I try it I don't know it'll be really adorable I have no one in this situation maybe if we turn off all the lights <laughs> it's <laughs> way too sweet with no flavor oh. and I can promise Santa's coming to visit no he wouldn't miss this in Christmas times time now so the three of us together baked all of the stuff you see before you so we actually did four batches so we did all we did the fudgy cupcakes from fudgy cupcakes from the book and then we did the Ghirardelli double chocolate over here and then in front we have the Betty Crocker blueberry muffins and then we have the Joanna fluke um, blue blueberry muffins Oh no. <laughs> no, no, no. It was really hard. Whoa. I don't want to taste this. <laughs> Whoa. I would, really I would want definitely them. rather have a box. I would rather not have any of them. Okay. Yeah. All right. Moving on. on. <laughs> okay, the next one is Sounds the so Joanna Fluke <laughs> Fudgy Cupcakes and the Ghirardelli Double Chocolate. That one I'm not scared of. Okay, we'll so, start with the one we're Let's start the of. scary one first. I 
Christmas. It does just really taste dry. like sugar, just like that one. It's really it's like dry. It's dry. How is it dry? And it just tastes like sugar. It does not taste like chocolate. Definitely not fudgy. No, there's nothing fudgy about this. Mm, In fact, it was really hard. Okay. Yeah, so definitely the box. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Thanks for watching. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> So what did you think? Did you like the baking portion? Anytime I watch a baking video or something on TV or even see a commercial, I don't know if it's the power of suggestion, I must run out that very minute and get a cupcake, a piece of cake, a brownie, some pie. I don't know. I'm like very susceptible to baking, dessert, confectionery suggestions. So I hope you have something nice and sweet to eat while I read the first chapter of The Christmas Thief by Leslie Meyer. Now this is the third book inside of here, so let's get started. Chapter one, that bag is to die for. As a graduate of the Cavendish Hotel chain's Guest Come First program, Tony Leone was too well trained to point but Elizabeth Stone followed her colleague's gaze, which was fixed on a Chanel style handbag made of silver quilted leather with a long woven leather and chain strap. The woman carrying the bag was dressed in tight black jeans, stiletto heels, and a fluttering silk tunic. Her hair was bleach blonde and she was hanging onto the arm of an extremely muscular man. It's probably not real, Elizabeth replied, sneaking in a whisper. The two young women were wearing matching forest green blazers and standing behind the reception desk at the very posh, very expensive Cavendish Palm Beach Hotel. It was strictly against hotel policy to comment on the guests, but the staff members all did it, especially during the quiet times. Oh my gosh, if you tell me not to talk about somebody, I mean, I don't normally, but then it's like all of a sudden you want to. Do you have that too? Anyways, uh, the hotel was a historic landmark and attracted the rich and famous from around the world. Located right on the beach, the pink stucco building had eight restaurants, four pools, a spa, and recreational options ranging from tennis courts and an 18-hole golf course to paddle boards and shuffle boards. It was also steps away from Worth Avenue, which was lined with designer boutiques such as Gucci, Armani, Ralph Lauren, and Cartier. Of course it's real, Tony replied, giving her wavy blonde hair a toss. I saw it in the window at the Chanel store. I can tell the difference between a genuine Chanel bag and a knockoff, and I'm surprised you can't. I actually cannot, especially if someone's far away. Uh, although, I guess even if it was up close. Usually you can tell with the lining, like a nice liner, liner inside a purse means it's real, versus like, you know, the cheap ones just don't have any lining at all. Um, Elizabeth shrugged and tucked her short, dark hair behind her ears. If it's real, it's the only genuine thing about her. Her hair is bleached, I bet she's had quite a bit of work done. She gazed around the vast, luxuriously appointed lobby where a round gilt and marble table with an enormous display of pink poinsettias was centered beneath a fabulous crystal chandelier and through the glass doors where the sun was shining brightly on a flower bed filled with colorful tropical plants, she shook her head. I've been in Florida for almost six months and I'm still not used to this weather. 82 degrees and sunny, can you believe it's almost Christmas? I kind of feel the same way because I'm here in California. I actually have the AC on right now. I don't know if you can tell, I'm kind of sweating. It's kind of warm here. Anyways, it's still November by the time that I'm reading this. Um, uh, yeah, Tony said, winding a lock of hair around her fingers. They put the poinsettias and amaryllis plants in the lobby weeks ago. She lived in Florida her entire life and didn't find the climate the least bit odd, unlike Elizabeth, who had grown up in Tinker's Cove, a small town located on the coast of Maine. Don't tell me you missed the snow. Most people come to Florida to get away from the cold winters up north. Elizabeth hid a few keys on her computer and went to a favorite site. It's 25 and snowing in Tinker's Cove, she said. Looks like we're going to have a white Christmas. Tony looked over her shoulder at the live, live cam image show and a lighthouse, live cam image showing a lighthouse with snow swirling all around it and rough surf crashing on the rugged gray rocks below. I don't get it, she said. Why do you want to go there for Christmas? Elizabeth smiled. It's home. There'll be tree trimming and carol singing. You can do that here. It's not the same, Elizabeth said. You have to go caroling in the snow and have hot chocolate afterward in front of a roaring fire. I'd rather have a chilled martini on a deck overlooking the ocean watching the sunset. Elizabeth laughed. That's nice too, but Christmas is about family. I miss my mom and dad and sisters and my brother and especially my little nephew Patrick. He's almost three now and he's very excited about Santa Claus. Well, you've only got to wait a little more than two weeks and you'll be on your way flying north, she shivered. Personally, I think you're crazy to take your vacation in December. The hotel's really busy at Christmas and I'm going to be keeping an eye out for Mr. Wright. Tell me again what makes him Mr. Wright, Elizabeth urged. Well, he has to be tall and good looking 
and sweet, really considerate, said Tony, just as a very ugly, very short man came through the revolving door dressed head to toe in Ralph Lauren resort wear and sporting an enormous gold watch on a very hairy wrist. But I'll be willing to overlook all that if he's rich, she added under her breath as she pasted on a smile. Welcome to Cavendish, Mr. Moore. It's so nice to see you again. It's nice to be back, he replied. This place feels like home. I don't know how you do it, but I know I'm going to find my bags waiting for me in my room. There'll be an extra firm pillow on my bed and a sugar-free chocolate, and my favorite locale beer is going to be in the mini bar. That's our little secret, Tony said. Is it the same Visa account? No, no, Mr. Moore produced an American Express Platinum card. I've got a new one. Very well, Tony was clicking away at her keyboard, adding the new information to the extensive database the Cavendish chain maintained about all its customers. That database, envied throughout the entire hospitality industry, allowed Cavendish employees to provide top-notch service personally tailored to every guest and was the reason why Mr. Moore found that extra firm pillow, sugar-free chocolate, and light beer waiting for him in his room. Have a pleasant stay, Tony said, handing him the key card. Room 305, overlooking the pool. See, he asked Elizabeth, holding up the key card. My favorite room. You guys take better care of me than my wife does. It's our pleasure, she said. Just give me a call if there's anything we can do for you. Righto, he said, giving them a little salute with his key card and making his way to the elevator, pausing here and there to admire the blooming orchids and other holiday decorations. You know why he likes room 305, don't you, Tony asked. The view of the pool, Elizabeth suggested. Think again. It's not the pool, it's the woman in skimpy, it's the women in skimpy swimsuits. So Mr. Moore is a bit of a voyeur, said Elizabeth, giggling, just as the hotel manager, Sergei Dimitri, came out of his office, which was located behind the reception desk. Mr. Dimitri was a neat middle-aged man with slick back hair, a small mustache, and a pronounced French accent. Guests adored him, frequently commenting on his warm smile and accommodating nature, but staff members had a somewhat less favorable opinion of him. I did not see a French accent coming out of Sergei Dimitri. It's kind of like when people meet me, because my real name in uh, real life is Lisa Seifert. They don't expect to see an Asian person. I wasn't expecting French. I was expecting Russian or, I don't know, Bulgarian, something Middle Eastern when I heard Sergei Dimitri. But maybe that's just me. All right, ladies, ladies, how many times must I warn you not to talk about the guests? They pay your salaries. Remember that? If only Courtney would hear her, I bet she could do a really good French accent. I cannot, even though I studied France for years and lived there, but I, I never learned how to speak French. It was really hard. Okay, of course, Mr. Dimitri, Tony said with an innocent expression. His gaze rested on Elizabeth. I'm surprised at you, Elizabeth. I don't want to have to place you on probation. Elizabeth didn't like the sound of that. Employees who were on probation could not take vacation time. Oh, please no, Mr. Dimitri, she said. I'm terribly sorry. Mr. Dimitri's eyes were hard, like round black buttons, and his mustache br bristled. You've been warned. Don't let it happen again. Oh, it won't, she said. I promise. And don't forget, he told them, there's a staff meeting this afternoon when your shift ends. Elizabeth felt like groaning but restrained the impulse. Staff meetings were held off the clock on employees' own time, and she had been planning to spend the evening digging her cold-weather clothes out of storage in anticipation of her vacation. Well, we'll be there, Tony said. Never fear. Good, Mr. Dimitri said, spying an elderly guest exiting the ele elevator looking a bit lost. Mrs. Fawnstock, he cooed, hurrying toward her. What can I do for you? Mrs. Fawnstock's wrinkled face immediately brightened. Oh, Mr. Dimitri, how lovely to see you. Is something the matter, dear lady? Well, this is so silly of me, but I'm supposed to meet my friend Doris, and I can't seem to find the Victorian tea room. Has it moved, she asked, furrowing her brow. Never fear. These corridors can be confusing, Mr. Dimitri snapped his fingers. Elizabeth, please escort Mrs. Fawnstock to the Victorian tea room. Elizabeth hurried across the thickly carpeted space, and Mrs. Fawnstock's look of befuddlement was replaced with a serene smile. You're such a darling to help me, she said. It's my pleasure, Mrs. Fawnstock, Elizabeth said, taking your arm. Now, if you'll just come this way, I'm sure we'll find your friend waiting for you. Mr. Dimitri stood watching a thoughtful expression on his face as Elizabeth escorted the elderly guest through the spacious lobby, which was dotted with numerously, numerous luxuriously appointed seating areas. He noticed with approval the way she matched her pace to the old woman's and kept up a lively conversation as they proceeded along the paneled and carpeted corridor leading to the tea room. The hotel's largest function room, the Borgenville Villa room, was packed with employees when Elizabeth and Tony arrived, and everybody was talking, expressing different expectations about the staff meeting. Bonus. Holiday bonuses. I'm sure they're going to announce bonuses, Tony said, taking a seat next to Kieran, one of the doormen. Don't be daft, Kieran said gloomily. Layoffs. Is this 
it's this recession. Don't you see? They're going to cut staff. The wholesale's got something like 500 rooms and more than 1,500 employees. Do the math. Nonsense, said Ada, one of the housekeepers. She was wearing the lavender shirt waist dress with the white lace collar that all the housekeepers wore. The rich are doing just fine. There's no recession for them. And that's who comes to this place, this hotel, the 1%. If you ask me, occupancy's been down, Karen insisted. I know my tips are. Maybe it's something about the health insurance plan, Elizabeth said, following her mother Lucy's oft-expressed advice not to panic until you had to. There aren't any charts or books, Tony observed, indicating the single podium in the front of the room. Wouldn't there be stuff like that if it's only a new health plan? Elizabeth suspected her friend was right, and her heart gave her a little jump when Mr. Dimitri appeared and took his place, tapping the microphone. Attention, attention, he said. I promise to be brief. The room quieted as everyone waited to hear what he had to say. A few fingers were crossed, and a few people were holding their breath. I see some anxious faces. Anxious faces, he said with a laugh. Well... You can relax. I have good news. The employees who were holding their breath exhaled. Some even chuckled. I have the pleasure of announcing that our hotel has been chosen for a great honor. The entire hotel has been booked by Wall Street financier Jonah Gruber for a Christmas extravaganza for 600 of his closest friends. Mr. Dimitri nodded, waiting for the employees to absorb this information. While not exactly ecstatic, everyone seemed interested, wondering what the extravaganza meant for them personally. Elizabeth found herself feeling a bit let down since the event would most likely take place during her vacation and she'd miss it. She almost wished she could stay to see all the famous people who would be attending. The highlight of this four-day celebration will be a fantastic black tie dinner dance, the Blingle Bells Ball, at which Mr. Gruber's wife, the lovely cinema star Noelle Jones, will wear the amazing ruby and emerald imperial parure. Parure, I don't know how to say that. But it's spelled P-A-R-U-R-E. Uh, you may remember that Mr. Gruber bought the Parvuru, which was originally created for Empress Marie Louise at auction for $47 million. Finally, Mr. Dimitri got the reaction he wanted. There was a collective gasp from the assembled employees. That's correct, $47 million. Needless to say, security will be a top concern. And that is why I would like to turn this meeting over to our security director, Dan Rayburn. Rayburn, who had been standing to the side of the room, came forward. He was a stocky, muscular man in early middle age with a gray brush cut, and he had the easy bouncing movement of a former boxer, but rumor had it he was actually ex-FBI. My top concern, and yours too, is the safety of our guests, Rayburn began, his eyes moving restlessly over the group. This event will bring extra challenges, but also because the guest list will include European royalty, celebrities, politicians, even the first lady, all of these high profile people are potential targets for crimes ranging from simple theft to kidnapping. I'm asking you all to remain vigilant. You are the first line against criminal activity. You must keep your eyes and ears open and report anything anything at all and it, that appears suspicious to you. If you see something, say something. Sounds like the New York subway. Uh, I don't know if you guys are, if you've ever been in New York that like it goes on the intercom all the time and there's signs everywhere, but maybe that's not New York. Maybe it's like all major cities. So anyways, everyone nodded in agreement and Rayburn cracked his grin. I'll be issuing more specific instructions in the future. So for now, I'll turn things back to Mr. Dimitri. But first, let me say I have a very... I have every confidence that together we can make this a safe and secure celebration for our guests. Elizabeth nudged Tony. Sounds like you'll have some prime husband hunting opportunities. To her surprise, Tony didn't look pleased. Don't count on it. We're all going to be under a microscope. And believe me, if anything goes wrong and something will count on it, we're the ones who will be blamed. Wow, she is a glass half empty kind of gal, huh? Uh, Mr. Dimitri was again tapping the microphone, demanding silence. Thank you, Mr. Rayburn. I know I can count on you all to cooperate with Mr. Rayburn's plans for security. And now, just one more thing before you go, dot, dot, dot. There was suddenly an air of tension in the room. They all knew Mr. Dimitri's habit of delivering bad news just before he ended a meeting. All vacation scheduled for the rest of the month are canceled. We need all hands on deck to prepare for this special event. It hit Elizabeth like a hammer. No vacation, no white Christmas. No little Patrick squealing with delight at the presence under the tree. Too bad, Tony said, sympathizing. Yeah, Elizabeth said, remembering another favorite expression of her mother's. Be careful what you wish for. For a moment, only a moment, she wished she couldn't, she wouldn't be missing seeing all the famous people, and now she'd gotten that wish. Cheer up, Tony urged. We'll have fun, you'll see. I guess it could be worse, Elizabeth grumbled, joining the crowd of employees flowing through the door. 
Absorbed in disappointment, she didn't notice Mr. Dimitri until he tapped her on the arm. A word, please, Elizabeth? Her eyes met Tony's in a shared look of dismay. Then she followed Mr. Dimitri to his office, certain she was about to be fired, or at the very least, placed on probation. Things weren't going her way today, that was for sure. She never should have said that remark about Mr. Moore. Sit down, Elizabeth, he urged, shutting the door after they stepped into the room and seating himself behind his desk. Elizabeth obeyed, bracing herself for the bad news. No matter what happened, she vowed she wasn't going to cry, and if she got fired, well, she'd be able to go home for Christmas. You've been noticed, he said, smiling. What a sadist, Elizabeth thought. He was actually enjoying this. Your excellent work has been noticed. Elizabeth sat up straighter. What the heck was going on? You may have noticed that our assistant concierge, Anne Marie, has been on sick leave. She called today and told me she has Epstein Barr and won't be able to return for at least four weeks. My sister had that once, Elizabeth said. That's too bad. Indeed, to Mr. Dimitri said. And Anne Marie's absence at this busy time of year poses a problem for us. I've discussed the matter with the head concierge, Mr. Kronberg, and he agrees with me that you should take her place. This wasn't what she'd been expecting, and Elizabeth struggled to process this new information. For a moment, she pictured herself sitting at Anne Marie's curvy little French desk in an alcove off the lobby, impressing guests with her knowledge and expertise. Or not, she thought, assailed by doubt. Did she really have the skills and experience the job required? She was still learning to find her way around Palm Beach, but she realized, brightening, this might be a genuine opportunity, and Mr. Dimitri wouldn't have suggested it if he hadn't had confidence in her abilities. Finally, she spoke. I'm flattered, she said. I'll do my best. Good, he said. You can start tomorrow. Elizabeth was seated at Anne Marie's desk the next morning, waiting patiently for Tony's arrival. She couldn't wait to see her friend's reaction, and Tony didn't disappoint when she took her place at the reception desk. Her eyes rounded in astonishment when she spotted Elizabeth, and she heard right over. As if, if my like closest work friend had just been pulled aside by the boss, and it was for something super secret, I would literally hunt her down, or text her, or call her, or something. I would not just wait until the next day. Or maybe I'm just crazy. Could just be me. I don't know. All right. What's this? She asked. Did you get a promotion? Elizabeth shrugged. It's temporary. Anne Marie's got Epstein Barr. Lucky you. We'll see. I, I feel like a fake. I, I don't really know what I'm doing. Tony grinned. Just pretend, she said in a parting, dashing back to, to her post where she spotted the head concierge, Walter Kronberg, stepping out of the elevator and heading in Elizabeth's direction. Elizabeth's direction. He was a tall man with gray hair, brushed straight back. From his stiff, formal manner, Elizabeth, su blah, blah, blah. Elizabeth suspected he might have be a retired military officer. She stood up to greet him and said, I'm very honored to take Anne Marie's place. I know it's, challenge it's a challenging job, but I'm a fast learner and I'm a hard worker. Very well, Elizabeth, he said. Now we must get back to work. You have a lot to learn and we're under pressure with the Gruber event in the just two weeks. He sat down in her chair, indicating she should take one of the chairs provided for guests and sit behind him. First of all, you need the computer password. Elizabeth knew that concierge had a higher level of access to Cavendish Data Bank, to the Cavendish Data Bank, and was interested to see what information was now available to her. I must warn you, all the information is highly confidential. We don't want to be reading the national be reading in the National Enquirer that one of our guests has a passion for cashew nuts. Elizabeth was tempted to giggle, but stifled the impulse. She didn't think Mr. Cronenberg was joking. Of course not, she said with a serious nod watching as he wrote the password on a slip of paper. Got it, he asked when she nodded. He tore the paper into tiny bits, which he pocketed. Elizabeth had a strange sense of dislocation. Was she being trained as a, an assistant concierge in a posh hotel, or was she being briefed for a mission to defend national security? Now, Elizabeth, Mr. Cronenberg continued, on occasion, one of our guests will require access to the hotel safe when neither I nor Mr. Dimitri will be available. In that case, you will need the combination. Elizabeth swallowed hard. This was quite a bit more responsibility than she expected, and she remembered Tony's warning that if something went wrong, the staff would be blamed. Right, she said. This is why you never want negative friends around. Like, it's just going to get in your head. It's going to ruin your next promotion. It's totally going to psych you out. Just have positive friends. That's the moral of this lesson. The combination is in the box, he continued, pr producing a small gray metal cash box from a side drawer. The key to this box is kept with the paper clips. Elizabeth opened the shallow central drawer and found the compartment filled with paper clips and dug through them, producing a small silver key. Remember, he said, it is most unlikely that both Mr. Dimitri and I would be unavailable, but it does occasionally happen, and we don't want our guests to be inconvenienced. I understand, Elizabeth said. You must tell no one about the combination, he warned in a most serious tone. Of course not. But I think you will enjoy this job, he said, standing up. You'll find our guests are most delightful, and you'll see that it's a pleasure to help them. Sometimes the requests are challenging, but there's great satisfaction in coming with, up with the perfect solution. A quick smile flickered across his lips. Then he wished her good luck and left Elizabeth on her own. 
She had a busy morning arranging horseback riding for one guest, making dinner reservations for several others, and changing an airplane flight for Ms. Mrs. Fonstock, who had decided to stay a few more days. Around 11, she heard she caught a breather, but when she glanced across the lobby at the reception desk and gave Tony a little wave, she only got a, an odd little smirk in response. She was about to go over and ask what the problem was when another guest approached her desk. I'm sorry to bother you, he said a tall, good-looking guy in his early 30s, removing his Ray-Bans to reveal bright blue eyes. He dressed casually in a polo shirt and khaki shorts with Tiva sandals on his bare feet. Not a problem, Elizabeth said, taking his tousled, sun-bleached hair, broad shoulders, a lean torso and finding him incredibly attractive. I'm here to help. All right, that was the end of chapter one. It's a shorter story. I'm super excited. We obviously all know the $47 million piece of jewelry is probably going to be stolen because it's called the Christmas Thief. And if it isn't stolen, that would be a massive disappointment. All right, super excited to see you. Are you still here? <laughs> I'm gonna see you on Friday. December 14th for our book club discussion of all three books. And yes, I will be providing a character list like I always do. So that will be on Crowdcast and it'll be right in the description, not the description, like once you log into Crowdcast, you'll see a little box that says download the character list. It's just that easy to find. All right. I hope everyone is having a fabulous weekend and I will see you guys later. I have more videos for Cozy Escape coming up. We have Cosmas coming up, which is December 1st through the 12th. It has a lot of great things going on. And I created a guide for all of you. I was going to say this year, but I wasn't part of Cosmas last year. So this year uh, we will have a guide so you can download that, follow along, put your book like tracking recommendations or TBRs, to be reads inside of that guide. And then you can snap a picture and share it with everybody. The official hashtag is Cosmas. And don't forget, most important of all, is that we have Secret Santa for the Cozy Book Club members, um, or the Cozy Escape Book Club members. So make sure to join if you would like to do that. And we would love to have everybody participate. And it doesn't matter where you're located, US, international, we're going to be mashing up people internationally. Um, so that is happening very, very soon. Make sure to sign up. The deadline is, I think, today. Is it today? I don't know. I'm so bad at hosting these things, but you still have time if you sign up today. All right. I will talk to you guys later. Bye.